Welcome back to 12 Days in March. In this section, we'll pick up our discussion of mitral valve disorders, focusing on mitral regurgitation. You have to admit, this is a pretty good opening slide, highlighting the murmur at the cardiac apex and radiating to the axilla. And continuing to compare and contrast, this will be the only systolic murmur described at the apex. Since it corresponds to LV contraction, it is described as loud or harsh. No confusing this with the low-pitched diastolic murmur of mitral stenosis. Maneuvers are not typically described with mitral regurgitation, and I make early mention of maneuvers because these will be introduced in the upcoming video on mitral valve prolapse. And just as a reminder, here are the three valvular disorders we'll discuss with the mitral valve, stenosis, regurgitation, and prolapse. Although not discussed in this video, we understand that mitral valve prolapse is characterized by a mid-systolic click, but once the valve prolapses, a late systolic murmur can also be appreciated. I mention this so you won't get confused by the description of a regurgitant murmur in a prolapse patient. Not to worry, you will have no problem identifying the prolapse patient on USMLE Step 1. We'll get to this topic shortly. So here is the summary of mitral regurge. It reminds us again this is a systolic murmur, heard at the apex, radiating to the axilla, and it is described as loud or harsh. But here are the key associations or derivatives that will be discussed in this video, including acute MR in the setting of papillary muscle rupture, and MR complicating any dilated cardiomyopathy, including acute rheumatic fever, as discussed in video number two on valvular heart disease. We then proceed to the first of our endocarditis road trips, focusing on subacute bacterial endocarditis, as the majority of those questions focus on infection in the mitral valve, so I decided to park it here, offering a truly integrated review. Before launching, let's snag this key pharmacology derivative. Students generally have a good understanding of this topic, so what is the mainstay of management in a patient with mitral regurgitation? Answer, afterload reduction, typically with an ACE inhibitor. The goal of treatment is to increase forward stroke volume, and this makes good sense. We want to favor conditions that will permit the LV to eject blood forward into the aorta, not retrograde back into the left atrium. And just for completeness, this question could have been asked to include the actual agents. Same principle after load reduction. Although unlike mitral stenosis with complex hemodynamics, mitral regurgitation is pretty straightforward and makes pathophysiologic sense if we focus on the appropriate curve. The hemodynamic aberration with mitral regurge will be seen in the LA pressure curve since we aren't typically affecting the left ventricle or aortic pressures. So what would happen to the LA pressure curve in a patient with insufficiency of the mitral valve transpiring during systole or LV contraction? And there it is. Nothing complex. The LA pressure rises due to the regurgitant volume. Once you identify the point of LV contraction, it is easy to envision blood flow and thereby pressure being reflected back into the left atrium. I think the general challenge for students is to identify what these curves represent. Once you embrace the notion that the LA pressure curve is the low pressure one on the bottom of the cardiac cycle curve, the rest of the hemodynamics fall into place intuitively. And again, viewing the recursion in volume going back into the left atrium, we can understand the principle of afterload reduction. We want that blood going forward not backward. Moving beyond hemodynamic principles, let's talk about the LV chamber. Any disorder that enlarges the LV will stretch the mitral annulus and predispose to mitral regurge. So just like pulmonary hypertension and tricuspid regurge, questions involving LV chamber enlargement will likely include some description of a murmur at the apex. So here are the scenarios. A patient presents with shortness of breath. The physical exam reveals a 2 over 6 systolic murmur heard best at the apex. And then comes the qualifiers. In this instance, fleeting joint pain and the skin rash of acute rheumatic fever. Or the recent MI, which we'll discuss in a moment. So they present the scenarios and link it to hemodynamics. They assume you can interpret the physical exam and clinical vignette, deducing the diagnosis of mitral regurgitation. Then they pull out those LA pressure curves. MS versus MR. You need to be able to distinguish the two. The next scenario is in the setting of an anterior wall MI. The patient has acute shortness of breath and or signs and symptoms of heart failure on days 5 through 10. No chest pain will be offered, underscoring that we aren't dealing with ischemia, and they will report the new onset of a heart murmur. The murmur is radiating to the axilla, informing us this is new onset MR. Why did that happen? Answer rupture of the papillary muscle, or chordae tendinae. 
And here are the associated derivatives. Why days 5 to 10? This is the macrophage phase of recovery. FYI, we'll be covering cardiac pathology in a separate video. But let's just focus on the macrophage for now. Phage from the Greek to eat. The macrophage has a prodigious appetite eating indiscriminately. In this scenario, they are consuming dead myocytes. Fibrous tissue is yet to be formed. So what happens to that myocardium with those giant Swiss cheese sized holes? Rupture. Rupture of the papillary muscle, triggering our acute onset of mitral regurgitation. Be aware, this is the same scenario for LV rupture discussed in the cardiac tamponade video. From the NBME point of view, this is delicious. They get to integrate physical exam features with histopathology and pathophysiology crossing disciplines. And if they throw in a question about the best treatment, they get to integrate pharmacology as well. Great stuff. The third set of scenarios associated with mitral regurgitation includes a discussion of endocarditis. Given the importance and denseness of that material, I will present it in a separate video. So if you have any questions or concern about any of the material presented so far, please email me at 12 days. We'll resume our discussion of mitral regurgitation momentarily.